Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland Public Television with host Bethany Wesley. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello, welcome back to Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. Tonight, as we get started, I'd encourage you to take inventory of where you are at. Are you on a couch, in a chair, watching this program on a television or maybe a computer or a tablet? Temperatures have dropped recently, so you maybe have wrapped a blanket around yourself or lit a fireplace at your feet. Well, tonight we're going to turn our attention to those who don't have those comforts or luxuries. Every three years, the Wilder Foundation in St. Paul conducts a one-night survey of the homeless population throughout Minnesota. In the last survey, conducted in October 2015, it revealed that there were more than 9,300 homeless, homeless individuals in the state, not including those on American Indian reservations. In the 12-county region defined as northwestern Minnesota, there were 420 homeless individuals. But those counts, admittedly, underestimate the number of people likely experiencing homelessness, since many people experiencing homelessness do so outside of a shelter system. It is estimated that more than 15,000 Minnesotans were homeless in 2015. In Bemidji, there are a few options available for those without housing, but for tonight, we will focus on one in particular, the Wolf Center, a unique shelter that opened in 2016. Joining me tonight is Reed Olson, the chairman of the Nameless Coalition for the Homeless, which operates the Wolf Center. He's going to help us understand what exactly makes this shelter different and who it serves. Hi, Lee. Hi. Welcome. It's good to be here. So before we turn to the shelter itself, we want to kind of set the stage and go back a few years because something was happening. Uh, community members were seeing a problem. Mm -hmm. And so what was happening that led to what later became the coalition? What kind of got you and the community talking? Well, um, in the past uh, years, there's been a number of, of weather and alcohol related deaths in our community, usually about two or three a winter, I think is a rough estimate. Um, and I would also like to give some credit to um, Justin Glaw, who used to be a reporter at The Pioneer. He ran a, no a number of stories kind of showcasing who the people were that were living on the streets in Bemidji and kind of gave a face to, to the homeless um, in Bemidji. And uh, so after a couple of people passed away, I think it was in October of 2013, a group of people met at, um, at the library and then we met again, I believe, at People's Church and then started meeting regularly um, uh, to try and figure out what, what the community needed, what we might be able to do to help um, stem that tide. And uh, it took us a while. I think we met for about six months before we really figured out what we were going to do, what slice of the pie we were going to try and take, um, what we thought we could achieve, and decided that a, a shelter that, that catered to homeless people with chemical dependency issues um, was something that, that we could be able to, would be able to do. Um, we thought in October when we first met that we would be able to open one up by, by Christmas mm -hmm. and it took us uh, about two years and four months to get it done but relatively speaking I think it was a pretty good turnaround to open up a facility. You officially opened, I believe, was it February of 16? Yep. Okay. Yep. And so let's talk about the shelter itself for just a second, and we'll turn to the guests in just a minute. But where is it located? It's located at 522 America Avenue. Um, it is a 16-bed facility. Um, we're open from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. And we don't, you don't have to sign up ahead of time. There's no intake. There's a very simple intake process. But it's just a simple first come first serve, um, and um, we wait. You know, when they come in, people have access to laundry facilities, showers, um, clothes if they need new clothes. Um, so it's very bare bones. It's a real shoestring budget. Um, just basically, our goal is we are going to keep you safe and warm and alive tonight. Okay. You know. Um, what was it about this shelter in particular that's unique? Because there are other shelter options out there in Bemidji specifically, mm -hmm. but this one serves a unique population. In, in what way? Well, there's like the servants of shelter that helps 
people, uh, but they don't take in anybody that's been drinking, which is absolutely understandable. Um, we really try to focus on those people with, um, with chemical dependency issues. Um, People's Church takes in uh, all comers, I guess I'd say. So one of our hopes was that we would take some of the pressure off of People's Church and take in some of the people that would otherwise stay there. Um, so we are, are somewhat unique in that our main focus is on someone who has been drinking. You know, most of the people that stay with us, although, and we can talk about this later, uh, it's, we've been getting away from our target demographic, but okay. usually the majority of the people that are staying with us have been drinking that day okay. that they stay with us. Fair to say there's less focus on families then? Is it more of an individual Yes, base? yes, we okay. don't do families. It okay. is purely individuals. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate to have children in our setting, I don't think. Um, most of the people that we treat, uh, that we serve, have um, some sort of, of um, untreated mental illness. Um, not everybody, but you know, it's common. Um, and, um, and as I said, most people have been drinking, so it probably wouldn't be a very, a very good uh, um, atmosphere for, for children. Is it staffed? Do you have somebody there who's kind of supervising, or is it pretty open? Yes, no, it's staffed. Okay. It's absolutely staffed. Okay. Yeah, and that's probably our biggest constraint to our operations is funding for, for okay. staff, you know, is labor costs. But yes, there's always someone there. And we have a great staff. Um, our manager, Marcus, has been there now since we've opened and has a great relationship with the people that we serve. And that's really the, the, what makes it a success is the, the, the respect that our staff gives the people that we serve and the relationship that they've been able to build. Um, okay. Would you consider it a wet shelter? Like if people show up and they want to keep drinking, can they do that on site? Is it, is it put no. away? Okay. Yeah, so if someone, when someone comes in, um, they're asked if they have any drugs or alcohol on them. And, um, and if, they have, if they have alcohol, we will um, put it in a, we have a, basically a closet and we'll mark it with their name and lock it in the closet and then give it back to them in the morning. Okay. So people can come in um, intoxicated and with alcohol but then we'll remove the alcohol. Okay. And what, what, that, what that does, it might seem counterintuitive, some people have thought that maybe that's enabling people to drink, but by allowing them to have a safe place to keep their alcohol overnight, it gives them that security to know that it's not going to get stolen. Um, and it also relieves the pressure because if you buy a, a bottle in the morning um, and you know that if you fall asleep tonight out at a, one of the camps or out on the streets, it's probably going to get taken from you or you're going to lose it or something like that. So then the, the impulse then is to finish the bottle, is to drink it all so that you don't lose any of it. So we give them a little bit of security so they can drink less of it knowing that it's going to be safe overnight and they'll, that they'll have it in the morning. So it does have the, the, the reverse effect of maybe even moderating the amount that people okay. will drink. If there was someone who decided well, for whatever reason while they were on site that maybe they do want to get help, is your mm -hmm. staff member able to direct them or give them like resources to where they could go if, yes. if that was a Yes, question? and but that's a, a kind of a line that we draw where we don't, we don't push um, anything on anybody we want it to be a very um, welcoming uh, environment, so we don't try to put people into treatment or put people into counseling. Uh, if anybody asks us, then we're more than happy to direct them to resources. But we want it to come to be to, it to be their choice, you know, and not something that we're putting on them, because um, we want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable coming in and doesn't doesn't feel you know they don't need to be browbeaten. They know you know, where they are. Mm -hmm. And so we just try to give them a safe, respectful place. Okay. You know. I want to talk just for a second about um, Park Place Apartments is a new development that is in the process of opening right now in Bemidji. Um, it also provides a place for chronic abuseants mm -hmm. and those who are struggling with different, different mm -hmm. know, struggles. How is your shelter different than Park Place? Well, ours is an emergency overnight shelter. And so that is our purview. We are looking for keeping someone safe tonight. You know, um, Park Place is a permanent supportive housing. So it is an apartment building. The people that are staying there, they have leases, they have their own units. They come and go as they please, just like anybody in an apartment building. Um, where we kind of dovetail, we're kind of maybe the first step on the continuum of, of, of treatment or of, of help for people where we've built that relationship with, the, with our guests and we can encourage them to, to apply, to move into Park Place um, okay. and gain a little more stability in their lives. But so we're we're 
we're similar in, in, in goals of trying to help people, but we're quite different in how we operate. And really do, I think we really will see as, as we, um, as Park Place fills up and as they begin, yeah, d we'll see that we really complement one another. Would you say that you have a good relationship like across all the different shelters and opportunities? Are you guys pretty good at talking with one another and saying, you know, if it doesn't work to fit you here, you mm -hmm. could try X, Y, or Z? I, I think so. Yeah, I, I, I think that, that, I mean, everybody is, we spend so much of our time trying to make sure that we can keep our doors open that probably our biggest, um, um, the one thing that we could improve on the most is probably outreach and communicating with other people doing similar services. But we have a pretty good um, relationship with People's Church and we have a good relationship with Park Place. Um, Sandy Hannum from Village of Hope used to sit on our board okay. as we were developing and she was really instrumental in us figuring out how, how to operate, you know, um, so I think that we do, we have a good relationship. It could always, it could always be improved, um, but. Um, I wanna turn to the numbers a little bit. So this is your second full winter. Mm -hmm. So how many did you serve last winter? Um, last winter, total numbers, oh, I'm gonna have to cheat here. Um, I used to know this off the top of my head, um, and I'm not gonna be able to tell you. It was, I wanna say we did 2,900 okay. individual stays, and that's, that's I guess. Okay. No, that's okay. <laughs> and then, but do people but stay, is there a limit? Like, can they stay repeatedly all yeah, winter people, long? Yeah. Okay. Yep, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Um, okay. The, yeah, people can come in as, as long as they want. Um, in fact, uh, I can say that, like, in October, um, the percentage of repeat clients was about 66%, and okay. November was 69%. So we do have a kind of a core group that we serve, okay. but then lots of... Um, Lots of people that come and stay for one or two nights at a time, and then we maybe never see again. Okay. Or maybe then we'll stay, you know, a couple of times a month. Um, different people have much different, you know, um, scenarios or whatever, where they're, they're able to stay with some people part of the time, and then they find themselves outside, you know, so they'll come to us. Other people have nowhere to go, and so they, they will stay with us Longer. continually. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. So you open October 1st of the yes. year, correct? So now we're about two, just over two months. We're in the yes. middle of December now. Yeah. Have you seen an increased need versus last winter? Are you seeing it kind of drop off? What mm -hmm. are you kind of experiencing? Our October was very busy this year. It was, and I'm gonna have to cheat again. Um, our October was, was our total night stays um, was up about 73%. And so that was, um, we had 197 total bed stays in October of, of, uh, of 16. And this year we had 340. So okay. it was quite an increase. And it was really concerning for us because we only have 16, um, 16 beds. beds. So when you're already starting out right away in the milder months um, at that high level, we were afraid of what was gonna happen come January or February. Um, in November, they've kind of leveled off and our increase was only about 9%. Um, but I think along with that, um, an interesting development is that the number of female clients that we're serving is, is going up quite a bit as well. Um, we, did, we had 22 female, individual female clients in, in November this year, up from 14 last year. And um, we had 20 in October, up from eight the October, the year previous. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we're noticing is the amount of people that we're serving that don't fit our target demographic is increasing. Um, like I said, we're, our goal was really to serve um, the, the alcoholic homeless person, um, mm -hmm. and in our minds, male. Mm -hmm. And now about 60 or 65 percent of the people that we serve fit that demographic. Other people are just people that find themselves homeless for a variety of reasons. They might be in between apartments, or maybe they got evicted um, from an apartment or their family asked them to leave. You know. Um, and they're looking for a new place to go, um, and so they're staying with us. So we're finding that the, the scope of the people that we serve is really expanding, and um, it's a concern of mine. I think when, when you hear about Park Place opening up and then the fact that the Wolf is operating, you know, there's the Village of Hope um, and Servants of Shelter. And so one might think, well, you know, Bemidji's got it together. There's plenty of options for everybody. And that's really not the case. You know, um, Village of Hope is um, only able to, to take in so many people, so many families at a time. Um, the Servants of Shelter won't be, and that's the churches that, 
that take turns a week at a time hosting as, a, as an emergency shelter. They're not opening this year until January. Um, so I think that's part of the increase that we're seeing is the individuals that would otherwise stay at Servants of Shelter are coming to us. But my, my real concern right now is when, when we opened, we were looking at you know, who, who is not being served in the community and it was people with chemical dependency, that, you know, homeless people with chemical dependency that were not being served. Now it seems like this pendulum has swung the other way and there's us and there's People's Church and there's the um, Park Place that are all helping this, this demographic and the services that are for families and I think specifically of, of, you know, of single mothers with children that are having a hard time finding housing um, their options have really shrunk, and so that I, I, I think is the is the where we need to start looking now, okay. as far as is more. You've kind of addressed this gap, and now you're seeing that maybe this other one might be either emerging or yes. growing bigger. Yes. Okay. And and you know, if looking forward, if we want to keep the best way to render our facility unnecessary, is to make sure that nobody finds themselves in the positions that that the people that we serve are in, and that starts way back with with children and if if children that have stable housing tend to have stable housing as adults and vice versa children that that don't have housing security as 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 kids are more prone to have have issues when they become adults so i think that the 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 new focus in the community should be not that there hasn't been the focus already but we really need to renew our efforts on making sure that families and children have have um have stable and adequate housing you just mentioned something about rendering yourself possibly unnecessary. Would that be how you define success later on? Is that the ultimate goal? That is the goal, um, and that was w we um, we called the wolf the, when we first started talking about the wolf. We called the committee that was looking into it the stopgap committee. We knew that Park Place was coming down the pike, um, and we thought, okay, well, we need something until they open up, and that was kind of our initial goal but now that we've kind of and granted a lot of us were pretty naive about what we were doing I don't know that we would have done it if we knew how difficult it was it would be um, but um, uh, now I lost my train of thought but the stop um, gap, but so yes yeah. yeah so now that we're that now we've operated for a couple of years we see that there will always be that need for um, for emergency shelter in the winter especially um, that even if you have permanent supportive housing options in the community, you're not going to be able to, the turnaround, it still takes a number of days or, or weeks to get someone into one of those places. So, And when, meanwhile, there's other people for whatever reason that may be going back right, to square one. That, yeah. Yes, that find themselves homeless tonight. Yep. And it's it's 8 o'clock and it's 20 below and what am I going to do? Yep. You know, so I think that there will always be the need for, for us to be there. And then and then we can, we can point people to services when they come in. I want to turn a little bit to the funding, um, to the operations. Mm -hmm. So what is, how much estimated does it take to operate the shelter then through the winter? Well, we are trying to do our budget this year um, on much less than we did last year. We've been struggling to, to, to um, find uh, stable funding. Um, w I'll back up and say when we first opened up, we had um, so much support from the community. It was really wonderful. Um, when we purchased the building, the, the little church, it needed a lot of uh, uh, remodeling. Um, because it was a new use, we had to bring it up to current codes for everything. Um, and so we had to put in handicap accessible bathrooms. We had to put in a wheelchair, elevator, um, and a number of other things we had to do. And um, the estimate on that remodel was about $150,000. And I will quick give a, a shout out to Howie Zita, who volunteered to be our project manager and really leveraged his relationship with other contractors. Um, I think we spent about $30,000 as an organization because so many, um, I, I won't be able to name up. them all, but mm -hmm. so many Just people so many stepped partners. up, yes, okay. from plumbing and, and drywall and insulation and uh, wiring, um, the trusses that we had to have put in. Um, the, the demo that was done, um, everybody really stepped up, windows um, and other supplies and stuff. So we were able to do it at about 10% of the cost, well not 10%, it would be 20% of the cost or so. Um, and so that was really wonderful. Um, but moving forward, we, we, we can't, as I say, we can't just survive on bake sales and, um, and 
other events like that. They're great for building awareness about us, but so getting the word out, getting so yes, some more community yeah. support. Um, so to get back to your question, we're, we're I, I think that ideally our shoestring budget would be about a hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay. Um, this year we're looking at about seventy-five thousand dollars, and okay. next year it's about ten grand less than that. So we're pretty concerned about our 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 future stability. We're working on some grants um, that will hopefully make that you know smooth it all over. And I and I, I believe that we'll we'll find it um, that we'll be able to get the support that we need to be able to continue to operate because we are. We have shown that we're that we're a, a, a real um, asset to the community as far as um, keeping people out of the jail, keeping people out of the emergency room. Is it's the the amount of cost savings. It's it's. I think sometimes that it's difficult for us to prove a negative because we can't show how much we saved because that person never wound up in jail or never wound up in the ER. But well, we you can't know, prove necessarily that they would right. have, even though it makes sense that right. possibly but, that was the yeah. path. But anecdotally, we can we can show pretty confidently that we are saving um, the community a lot of money and giving people a safe place to be. Okay. Around. So when you talk about getting grants, do you look at it from a state perspective? Do you look at it locally? Uh, where Currently we have an, um, a grant through the Office of Economic Opportunity, which is out of the, it's an agency in the, in the um, um, uh, Department of Human Resources, or Human Services in the, in okay. at the state. Okay. Um, we're looking at a, a, a major foundation for another grant for coming up here. Um, and then we have applied for some smaller grants in the community and now I'm going to not remember what any of them are. That's okay. um, but, but there are some local grants that we've okay. been trying to get and every once in a while you might see us in the paper with the, the check and a handshake from various organizations. Um, a lot of churches have been really supportive of us and some, some other, other um, nonprofits too have, have supported us. And I've seen various drives, like I believe mm -hmm. there was one recently from Bemidji State nursing students who just developed a whole bunch of items to donate yep, for yep. you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the so community support is there. Yeah, absolutely. You definitely have that. Yep. Do, you, do you feel like the community as a whole understands what you referenced earlier about the the jail savings, the hospital savings, some of that detox situations. Is that harder to explain? I, I think maybe that is a little bit harder to explain because it takes more than a quick, you know, sound bite or, or caption under a photograph. But um, I think I, as I've tried to do outreach um, and as we've, we've tried to build um, awareness of what we're doing, um, that's something that we'll off, always talk about. And I, I, I really enjoy going and talking to church groups or civic organizations about what it is that we do and why it's important. Um, but that might be a little less understood. But I think that most people, just knowing that, I mean, everybody knows that we have um, a, a, a homeless situation in Bemidji, you know, and so I think just knowing that, that people have a place to go is, is often enough for people to know that people are being, you know, that people are being care, cared for. Um, in addition to some of the drives that we've mentioned here, we know that there are some events, I believe you did like a ride for the homeless mm -hmm. this summer. And yep. you have another event coming up here. We do. It's at uh, Bridget's um, Pub downtown uh, Bemidji on uh, December 30th, the evening of December 30th. It's a Friday, I believe, the Friday after Christmas. Um, okay. So come on down and, and uh, there'll be music and, um, and probably some more information. We usually have a little booth where we can talk to people about what it is that we do okay. um, and uh, bring lots of cash. Okay. <laughs> As we close, I want to kind of just talk about one of the bigger questions, which is what do you say to those who say, you know what, the problem is kind of their own making, it's kind mm -hmm. of their own choosing. If they mm -hmm. want to get in these other shelter situations, give up the booze. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of respond to people who have that, that position? Um, well, the short answers are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, people that, that find themselves in this situation, most of them have untreated mental health issues. And this goes back to, and we all, you know, the, the, the county right now is, um, working on a, on a, a, a $2 million grant that is specifically a jail diversion program for people suffering from mental illness. Um, um, we, um, we know that, that we have not been treating our mentally ill and the result is that they become homeless most, uh, all too often, you know. So the, and one thing that I say to people that, that the, the, if you can't, if you don't understand how it is that they got there, consider yourself very blessed. You know, it wasn't something that happened overnight. It's a it's a it's a road that they've been on for for 
a lifetime. And the, the amount of, of, oftentimes, the amount of, of tragedy that people have been through to get themselves to where they are is, is, is quite amazing. The fact that they're as functional as they are sometimes, I think, is a minor miracle. Um, so it, it, we have to be careful judging people when we really don't understand what, what is behind. You know, the, the alcohol is often a self-medication. Um, it's n not that people are lazy and don't want to work. You know, I think that a lot of times people are just in really bad straits. Okay. Well, Reed, I thank you for joining us and telling us about the shelter and about the work that went into it from the coalition standpoint. Thank you for watching us. If you'd like to learn more about the center or the Nameless Coalition, you can visit the website here on the bottom of your screen. They have a Facebook page. You can also stay tuned to Twitter. I'm sure we'll be announcing more about that event coming up on the 30th. So thank you for joining us. Tune in next time.